In this video, I will be taking a look at some techniques for preventing and detecting deadlock. I assume that you have already watched my video about deadlock in Java, and if not, you can find a link to it in the description below this video, and I recommend that you watch it before you watch this video. It will make it easier to follow what I am explaining in this video. The techniques I will be looking at are log reordering, timeout back off and deadlock detection. The first deadlock prevention technique that I will be looking at is lock reordering because it's by far the simplest. If you have watched my previous video about deadlock in Java, you will recognize this example here. It sets up a situation that causes a deadlock. We create two runnables here, runnable one and runnable two, and start them up in each their own thread. Runnable 1 and Runnable 2, they are doing almost the exact same thing, except for uh, a little bit of a difference in the order in which they do it. So Runnable 1 here locks, lock 1 sleeps for a while, then locks, lock 2. Runnable 2 here, first locks, lock 2, then sleeps for a while, then locks, lock 1. When started at the exact same time as is done in this example here, this will cause a deadlock where thread 1 here tries to lock lock 1, then waits for a while, tries to lock lock 2. And runnable 2 will try to lock lock 2, then sleeps for a while, then locks lock 1, or tries to lock lock 1. However, by the time that that uh, thread 1 here, or runnable 1 here, is ready to lock lock 2, it is already locked by runnable 2. And by the time that runnable 2 is ready to lock lock 1, it is already locked by runnable 1. This causes the deadlock. The deadlock occurs because the locks are not taken in the same order. They are taken, uh, they are locked in a cyclic order. Runnable 1 here locks lock 1 first, then lock 2, and runnable 2 locks lock 2 first, and then lock 1. The way to fix the problem in this particular case is to make sure that runnable 1 and runnable 2 locks the locks in the same order. This is what is also referred to by lock reordering. So you're making sure that all threads taking the same locks will also will always do so in the same order. So let me just fix this example here. We will say lock one here and lock one, of course, in the text. So, and then down here, we will say lock two right now. Um, um, and the sequence in which they are unlocked uh, we should probably also fix so that it is the same as in runnable 1. Now what happens is, in case um, lock 1 is already locked by runnable 1 by the time runnable 2 tries to lock it, well, runnable 2 will simply be blocked already here trying to take lock 1. And that means that runnable 1 can then progress down to take lock uh, 2, lock lock 2, and then unlock both of the locks. And once that happens, once these two locks are unlocked, then um, runnable two will then be able to lock one, lock one, lock lock two, and then unlock both of the locks. Uh, actually, I can see that the uh, order in which I unlock the locks are still a little bit different, but that is not so important. The order in which you unlock them, it's the lock, it's the order in which you take them that is most important. The second deadlock prevention mechanism I will discuss is the timeout back off. And basically what it means is that if a threat is attempting to take a lock and it is not possible to take that lock or to lock that lock within a given uh, time period, then trying to lock the lock simply times out and the threat then um, backs off of the lock, but it also then backs off of all other locks that it has already locked. So in the case here where runnable one timeout here is trying to lock lock one, and then after that tries to lock lock two, and that fails, then um, lock or uh, runnable one timeout here will release the lock of lock one, then sleep for a little while before trying again to lock both lock one and lock two. So that means that in case that these two um, runnables here end up in a deadlock, what will happen is um, runnable one here will be um, 
blocked, waiting to lock lock two, and vulnerable two here will be waiting to lock lock one. And then after uh, a little bit of time, they realize, oh, it's not possible to lock this lock, these locks that they're waiting for. They exit from the lock attempt, the try lock method, and then they release the other lock here, sleeps for a little bit of time, and this is a randomized, a randomized amount of time, and then tries again. The reason the time they sleep is randomized is to give uh, one of these threads here, one of these runnables here, a chance to lock both of these locks before the other one. And that way we can avoid the, um, the deadlock. If the runnable one and runnable two did not sleep a randomized amount of time after failing to lock the two locks here, after giving up, but if, but if they just immediately try to lock both of the locks again, you could end up in a live lock situation where um, both of the runnables here are stuck trying to lock the locks, giving up, trying to lock the locks and giving up continuously over and over again. And none of them would be able to make any real progress because none of them would ever get to a point where they were able to lock both of the locks here. So you would end up in a live lock situation. A uh, live lock is not the same as a deadlock, but the consequences for the systems uh, is the same that no threat can make progress. Let's jump into the runnable one timeout here to see how the runnables are implemented. As you can see um, in this runnable here, I am repeating the attempt to try locking both of the locks here within a loop. And I'm doing that in order to uh, deliberately provoke that sometimes the situation here ends up in a deadlock and then prints out that it fails to lock both of the locks, right? So in reality, you would probably not uh, be executing this within a loop, but I'm doing it explicitly to provoke the deadlock situation so we can see that the um, back off and timeout works. So what happens here is it first, it initializes the variable here failure count to zero. Then it tries to lock both of the locks in this method here. If that does not succeed, um, because the try lock both locks method will return false if it fails to lock both locks and true if it, if it succeeds. If it fails, it will enter this um, while loop here. Failure count will be incremented and we will print the message out here that this thread here failed to lock both of the locks and it will wait a little bit before retrying and it will print out the failure count as well. Then it will sleep um, 100 here times some random number here. So we will be sleeping a random amount of milliseconds between zero and 100 milliseconds. Now in a real system, you could probably reduce that to between uh, 0 and 10 uh, milliseconds, but it depends on how many threads are actually trying to lock these same locks. I mean, the more threads there are, the more time they might need to back off in order to give some space for one of the threads to lock all of the locks. Now, once it succeeds in um, locking both of the locks here, if the failure count is uh, larger than 0, we just print a message so we can see it and then it simply unlocks both of the locks and then um, repeats the exact same actions one more time within this while loop that keeps running. Now, runnable2 is doing uh, the exact same thing with the only exception here being the implementation of the try lock both locks. As you can see here, um, try lock both locks in runnable one will start with lock one, then lock two, whereas runnable two here will start with lock two and then try to lock one, lock one. And again, the difference in the order here is done to deliberately provoke some deadlock uh, cases. So we can see that um, the algorithm here actually backs off and retries and resolves the deadlock and gets out of it and can continue running. Now, as you can see here, um, in case the system or the runnable two here does uh, succeeds in locking lock two, but 
cannot lock lock one here after one second then it will unlock lock uh, lock two which it locked up here and return false from the method so once um, try lock both locks here exits then you will be guaranteed that both of the locks are unlocked and the same is true over here in um, in the try lock both locks of runnable one timeout here in case uh, lock one is locked and it fails to lock lock two here after uh, one uh, thousand milliseconds here then um, it will unlock lock one and return false as you can see i'm using the try lock method here which will try to lock the lock for a given amount of time and if it does not succeed in locking the, the lock here within this given amount of time the try lock method will return false if it succeeds in locking the the lock the try lock method will return true now let's try to run this deadlock timeout example and see what happens in practice once the code actually runs. Now, as you can see, deadlock occurs and you can see sometimes a couple of tries and uh, you can see here um, that many of these uh, deadlocks are resolved and after a couple of attempts, the threats here succeed in actually locking both of the locks. And you can see this continues down here, right? It keeps running into deadlocks, but it also re um, succeeds in resolving them. By the way, if you check out the description below this video, you will find a link to a GitHub repository where you can find the code for these examples here so that you can study them on your own. Now, just a gentle word of caution here. I do not guarantee that my implementations are 100% foolproof, so use them only uh, for studying, but don't rely on them you know, in your nuclear power plant software. The third technique for preventing deadlock is by detecting the deadlock before you even lock the locks. Um, and there are several different ways to do that. I will explain one of them here. Um, this technique is somewhat complicated, so I do not have a working code sample for it, but I will explain how it works on this diagram here. And, but be careful when you try to, if you try to implement your own version of this, because it's not that easy to get right. So, um, you might be better off just using somebody else's implementation already. But anyways, let's have a look at how it works. So what you do is you keep a graph of all the locks and threats that are involved in your current system. And the graph is modeled so that the locks here, the nodes in the lock, uh, the lock nodes in the graph they have a reference to the thread that has locked this lock here. Now this node here may not actually be the lock itself. This is a, a lock node that is separate from the lock itself actually. And the thread node here is also a thread node, which is an object that is separate from the thread itself. So this here is a graph that is representing the locks and the threads in your application, but they are not themselves the locks and the threads. They are no just lock nodes and thread nodes. <laughs> So in this case here, you can see lock one is locked by thread one and thread one is waiting for lock two. It's waiting to lock lock two. Lock two is locked by thread two and thread two is waiting for lock three. And lock three is locked by thread three. In this case here, you can see there is no deadlock because there's no cycle in this graph because thread three is not waiting for any other uh, lock sooner or later it it is assumed to be unlocking uh, lock three here and then thread two can take this lock here and then will unlock lock two here and then thread one can take lock two and then at some point will unlock one lock one again however if you know if uh, another thread here if thread three was trying to lock lock one then thread three would then check lock one and see if lock one was uh, involved in a deadlock. 
and it would do so simply by following the graph here and noting all the threads here and see if at some point it returns back to itself. If at some point this graph here points to thread 3, that means that the, the graph is waiting for thread 3. And that means that if thread 3 is trying to lock lock 1, but the graph here is waiting for thread 3 to unlock something else, then that means we have a deadlock. All right. Now, keep in mind here that in this graph here, there can be more than one deadlock, which are separate and individual. If you look at this situation here on the right, you can see that lock 4 is locked by thread 4, and thread 4 is waiting for lock 5. Lock 5 is locked by thread 5, and thread 5 is waiting for lock 4. Now, in this case, we already have a cycle here, right? We have a cycle meaning that these two threads here are, uh, are involved in a deadlock with lock 4 and lock 5. But this deadlock here is independent of the deadlock that could occur over here because of the situation if threat thre 3 tried to lock lock 1. So, um, as you can see, if thread 3 does not try to lock 1, lock one but simply unlocks lock 3, etc., and this graph um, dissolves itself, or how do you say, disconnects itself, then you do not have these threads over here and locks involved in a deadlock. But this deadlock over here still uh, exists, and you can still detect this deadlock over here separately from these nodes over here. If at some point I get a working code sample that can um, detect a deadlock in a graph like this, then I will probably make a separate video about it. And in that case, I will update the description below this video with a link to that video and to the code samples, of course. I do actually have some code which can uh, detect if there are cycles in such a graph here, but I do not have any code that can get it to work with actually locking the locks, only the graph itself. And that's not enough for you to use in a finished application. That's all for this video about deadlock prevention and detection in Java. Remember to check out the description below this video for a link to a textual version of this tutorial, as well as other tutorials related to Java concurrency. And if you like this video, please hit the like button. And if you want to see more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel.